And uh, that you might speak to hang around for lunch too, so you can sort of quiz them and <laughs> give them all the best suggestions about what they should be doing. And try and... <laughs> um, so I've persuaded Andy to actually um, lead the next part, which is how you might actually teach uh, introductory HCI. Um, in, in terms of our standards, in 144, it's the third bullet point, um, which is a very basic ability to look at a user interface and evaluate it. And it's also it ended up in the level two standard as well. It's that important, <laughs> um, which is using usability heuristics to do an evaluation. Um, so I guess we'll focus more on the second one because if we can do that, then the first one is really just a warm up for that. Um, and so, so I'll yeah, get Andy just to talk us through some of those ideas. Sure. And I, I brought along an interface we can evaluate too. Oh, great. Right. Yeah, we, we haven't heard what we're going to do, but we'll talk about something between us. We're winning it. Yeah. Um, Okay, so research is the uh, that's what I've been talking about so far. That's the tip of the iceberg, right? Um, but normally it's overkill. So even for most industry, they, they, don't, they don't focus on interfaces at the level that we've just been proposing. Um, they're much more interested in the, the rest of the pyramid or the rest of the iceberg. So you don't need to teach your students anything about research. Critical insight, absolutely. They shouldn't just be passive receivers of technology, they should start to be critic, critics of it and uh, thinking about what it means to be interacting and how things might have been done better. So how do you get the biggest bang for your buck? You've got very limited time to talk to your students about these things. What should you be trying to get across to them? And this is what I try to do in my undergrad teaching as well. So usability heuristics, they're, they're on your, your curriculum. They can be called many other things as well. Usability principles, usability guidelines, usability style guides. These are all essentially synonyms for the same type of things. They're thinking tools to help you consider what's good and bad about interaction. Uh, so they've been gleaned from 30 years or so of experience in uh, designing and working with graphical user interfaces. Um, so they're, they're trying to encapsulate what's good about interaction, but more often than not, they're, they're trying to steer you away from the things that are really bad about interaction, things that are known to confuse users, impair performance, uh, frustrate people. Uh, <coughs> have you heard of Edward de Bono's thinking hats? Yeah, yeah. yeah I thought you would have done. So these are these, they're very simple, one sentence encapsulations of a hat that you put on to think about uh, one particular aspect of the interaction you're provided by a particular tool. Uh, and they can be used formatively, so that's how Joey and Philip and I would be using it. So we're trying to invent a new style of interaction, and we're trying to think about, oh, how would that work with respect to the consistency principle of and so on. But it'll, they can also be used summatively, so you're given a user interface, like the ribbon, and you, you're wanting to think, well, how might that have been done differently or better? Uh, and they are used extensively in industry, so they, these are, you're teaching something relevant here, uh, very relevant. So, one of the first sets, uh, well, the first time they were called heuristics anyway, they've been called principles and style guides and so on by many people before. Uh, the usability heuristics you'll hear of most often are Nielsen's usability heuristics. They come from this book called Usability Engineering. Very, very accessible book. It's really written for managers uh, to convince managers that it's worthwhile having your staff or employees think hard about usability. And those are the ten uh, heuristics that he encapsulates in that book. So simple and natural dialogue. I'll walk through these in a little bit more detail soon. Speak the user's language, minimize the user's memory load, consistency, feedback, clearly marked exit, shortcuts, good error message, prevent errors, and help in documentation. Um, a few years later, Nielsen turned that set into a slightly different 10, so you'll, you know, if you want your students to have reading material associated with the heuristics, you can refer them to chapter 5 of this book, and there's a whole chapter describing those 10. Or you can refer them to the web where Nielsen's done an analysis uh, to figure out where he learned over time that those heuristics overlap one another. The website um, is um, user.com. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so that's that's the new the new ten. Pretty much all of the heuristics of principles, they all amount to the same thing. They identify the same issues. They're just very slightly 
differently formed thinking hats to put on. Um, but they'll identify the same usability problems in, in interfaces. So I also I put this slide to go together very late last night. And while I was doing it, I thought, well, you have to mention this as well. Do you, do you talk about this? Uh, it's, you got to read it, yeah. 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 Um, the other thing that I think is absolutely essential for thinking about user interfaces is Norman's model of interaction, which explains where and why many things in interaction go wrong. And it's very easy to wrap up in a couple of slides to tell your students where, where, why, how and why problems might come up. And it's uh, extracted from this book called The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman. Uh, it, was, it had an earlier title which was The Psychology of Everyday Things in the World. And it's a paperback, it's very widely read. So, it just, Norman's model tells you the obvious things about how systems come to be. First off, there's a designer, and a design, or a set of designers, and this designer actually goes off and creates a system. And hopefully the designer has created that system with a strong and firm idea of how users will use the system, but honestly that's not always the case, they're just trying to meet some deadline. It'll release the software <laughs> fast. Um, then there's a user, and the user needs to make a prediction about what their action is going to do. I want to print my file in PDF format. Um, so they'll, they'll do something to the system, open a menu, uh, open a dialog box or something, and the system will give some feedback to the user, hopefully. Uh, they don't always do that. If the user doesn't get any feedback, they don't know whether it worked or not. Okay, so this is, this is all very obvious. Where the model, I think, Norman's model becomes a little bit more useful, you, you gain more insight, is that there's a designer's model, right? The designer had some intention of how the user was supposed to interact with the system. Now, sometimes that model is really nebulous and fuzzy. The designer doesn't know really what they're trying to build. Honestly, that happens. And they're just kind of building it as they go, oh, let's throw another bit in. Oh, I've got to meet the deadline tomorrow. The system, it's a concrete thing, it's implemented in program code, but it projects to users a way that it's supposed to be used. This is called affordances, have you heard of affordances? Things look like they're supposed to be used in a particular way. You can wander all the way around any building you like, um, the University of Canterbury is a good one. It's, it's, now here's a nice door, well designed door. I'm unlikely to walk up to this door and try to fit my fingers behind this panel and to pull the door towards me, right? But all the way, so, so I only have one option with this door, which is to push this panel right here to open the door. I'm not going to pull it. But all around the university, all around buildings everywhere, you'll find doors that are designed to be pushed that have big handles on them. And what happens is, what does a handle say to you? It says, pull me. So you walk up to it and go, <laughs> so, so there's an affordance, of, handles cost more than panels as well. So money has been spent to make the system hard to use. Right? Because nobody thought about the interaction. So affordances are very important. Um, things look like they're supposed to be used in a particular way. So that's the image that's projected to your users. And your users are sitting there confused, going, well, the handle should be pulled. So they pull it and they bang their head. And they then synthesize the user model. They learn about how they're supposed to be using it. Ideally, the designer's model is exactly the same as the user's model. But there is no direct method of communication other than manuals, which simply don't get read. Um, so the user is trying to build their model based on interaction with the system image. So this saves many of the places where interaction can go wrong. The primary source for the user, for their user's model, is really their previous experience in the real world. Right. Okay. So that's where I was intending to finish until uh, so I can do this. Okay, so Nielsen's 10 usability heuristics, uh, the old 10. And I am, this is really going to be a overfast one. I do this in something like four lectures normally. Well, I should mention that um, one of the uh, things that Heidi's doing is putting together a PowerPoint presentation that's got all of these heuristics in it with um, examples and so on. Um, so we'll put that up on Exactive, and then you can just put in your own examples of your favourite independents that you smash into. <laughs> <laughs> 
favourite buttons that entice you to do something in favour of something. Level, level two, are they, should they know all ten? Sorry? Do they need to know all of all of these ten heuristics? Oh, like, do they need to know all ten? Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's, it's a project, so um, you just get, I mean, Andy had the list of ten up before. Um, and essentially what you'd be doing is you take a device, and this is the personalising part, I'll just talk about how the project would work. So, so pick any device, a cell phone, an MP3 player, a um, Microsoft Word ribbon, um, and just some small part of it. And uh, were you going to get to that or shall I just go to that part? No, you yeah, yeah, okay. um, and, then, and, and so um, then the student would take those 10 heuristics and say, and you could do it one way or the other. You could either say, I'll try and find an example for four or five of those heuristics that this device fails on. Um, or you can do it the other way around. I'll use the device, or even better still, I'll get someone else to use the device. Uh, and whenever they trip over or get frustrated or swear it or whatever, I'll go and look up which of those heuristics was the one that, that probably caused that. And it, it, quite often it's two or three. Um, so, it's, you know, do they have to know? No, but it's, it, it's just a, a benchmark to measure everything by. Um, rather than the alternative is to say, oh, you know, the, this MP3 three pair sucks and the iPod is very cool. Gives you something very different to say. About it. yeah. It's worthwhile pointing out too that many of these heuristics overlap one another, and uh, so if you've got <coughs> one particular problem that's prominent in an interface, it's likely to be captured by many heuristics. Okay? And that's a good thing because it's kind of a fail-safe. You are likely to spot the biggest flaws. Um, so very quickly, the first of the heuristics: simple and natural dialogue. What does it mean? Well, I take it to mean. Is the complexity of what it is the user is trying to do, the domain of the application, is the complexity well managed? I'm sure you've all found devices, you know, mobile phones, I want to make calls and I want to send the occasional <coughs> text message, that's it. And yet this thing kind of amplifies the complexity of doing that. It's more complex than it needs to be. Okay, so is, sim is it as simple as possible, but no simpler? Right? You don't want to lose some functionality. I want to be able to call people and send text messages, and I can only call people. Now, that's too simple now. Or a nuclear power plant that has a you know, big green button and a big red button. Go and stop. <laughs> that's, that's, that's too simple. You, you probably want higher level of control than that. So I, I then subdivide that into uh, organization of the interface, really. Presentation, does it look simple and natural? Because right? you can have something that, that just the presentation is disorganized and cluttered, unfriendly. And then the navigation, so as you move through system states, select things from menus and so on, is that movement through the states simple and natural as well? Do things flow in the order you'd expect? Or do you find yourself going, what? what's this now? Um, so graphical design, using Windows frugally, less is more. So let's sort of look at that. So here's two applications trying to do exactly the same thing. Winner versus the minimized iTunes interface. What do I want to do with my music? I want to play, pause, and skip tracks. Pretty much everything I want there. This one, you know, look at all of the components there and think about what are they supposed to be doing. Does it need to be like that? Maybe it's, you know, the answer may not be, the, the answer may be yes, it does need to be like that because it's designed for people who have specific needs. But this is more likely to be nice and, I, I think, nice, simple design. So, the, the gadget I thought we might look at at some stage, this is an alarm clock. And uh, so, well, one example here, the, the thing I really love about this alarm clock is that when you set the time, it's got an up and a down button. Um, so, so most alarm clocks, you know, you go one minute past the time you're trying to set. And, uh, yeah. So, yeah, here's, okay. here's another clock, right? I had a clock prepared for you. Yeah. So this is an old one from an old Microsoft system. You know, there's an affordance here, right? I'm wanting to set the time. What am I likely to want to do from my experience of the real world? Grab the hand, oh, grab the hands and drag them. Maybe because there are these weird <coughs> check button things, click on those. I'm certainly not going to anticipate that use the left mouse button to change the minute in which direction. Use the right <laughs> button. Right, oh, it's just. Um, uh, there's endless examples of all of these things. Uh, you know, so I'm, as I say, I'm, I'm under a lot of time pressure. So I'll move on. Speaking the user's language. 
Okay, and this again is a, it captures notions like affordance. Do are things presented to users in a way that makes sense for the people who have an expertise in whatever ever area you're supposed to be using? So sometimes software is made for accountants. Computer scientists aren't accountants. Computer scientists build the system, but they may not know the language that accountants have. Computer scientists build systems for uh, um, you know, radiographers. Hopefully they know the language of the radiographers, that you need to learn that language before you can build a system for the radiographers. Know your user. Um, so, yeah. Let's look at a couple of examples of that. So here's a, you know, you can imagine an ATM giving you a message like this, maximum withdrawal of $50 at, that, at this time. That's in a language I understand. This one is not. X25 connection discarded due to network congestion. <laughs> Which one do you think you're more likely to see? There's a, another real interface. You know, flag 1 to 20. What does that mean? It's absolutely nothing I suspect to anyone. It means something to the, to the person who's building the system, but to nobody else. Um, even things like this, these toolbar icons. You know, this, they're an annoyance. So often you look at those things and go, what earth is that supposed to be? <laughs> Minimizing the user's memory load. Okay, so uh, a lot of systems require the user to keep track of stuff in their memory. Um, systems should try to minimize that. Defaults and examples are one of the best uh, examples of that, so I'll just move on to a quick example. Here's one dialogue for doing dates. Now, I'm sure you've all seen this, uh, a computer system that asks you for a date like this. You go, well, what the heck am I supposed to type in there? There's a different field, month, day, year, that's slightly better, but you don't know whether you're supposed to type a number in there or a word. This one's getting slightly better, but you're still required to do all the typing, whereas now you've got a drop-down. This is the best one yet. Better still, you have a drop-down calendar, and it's like, I know I need to do it next Monday. What date is next Monday? Well, the system has access to all of this. So we're getting zero default information, plenty of default information. This is what we want to see. Uh, being consistent is a golden rule of uh, HCI, so this should be, should be consistent in the consistency in the graphical design and the command structure in everything else. So, well, let's just do two examples. Is this over oh, to okay. yeah. um, So, you know, here's an example of the meaning chip, uh, meaning chip? Meaning inconsistency. <laughs> you drag an MP3 icon to the file, to the wastebasket, what do you get? Nothing. Delete the file. You drag a CD to the wastebasket, what do you get? Eject the disk. You know, what's the last thing you're going to do with your valuable CD? <laughs> <laughs> the last thing you're going to do is put it in the wastebasket. So that's a meaning chip in, uh, a meaning inconsistency. There's an inconsistency in graphic design, so somebody's come up with a bunch of icons and later the graphic artist has gone on holiday, so they've just stuck another one in uh, to the system and it just sticks out like a <laughs> Uh, providing feedback. Users have to know the state of the system in order to uh, realize what's going on. So you must, the system should continually inform the user about the state of the system. So what the system's doing, um, the system's interpretation of that. Um, yeah, and there's guidelines to the, to the, yeah, the about how long systems should respond by, the types of feedback that you need to give to your users for particular uh, timelines. So if the time is, if the time to process an action and give feedback is less than 0.1 of a second, users will perceive that as being more or less instantaneous. So if you're wanting to allow the user to drag something across the screen, you need to give feedback of that in less than 0.1 of 